Good morning, everyone. I'm Ali Rose. I'm Chief of Space Division here at Geoscience Australia. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledging their continuing connection to land, water, sky and community. We here at Geoscience Australia pay, pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders past and present. As Gender Equity Co-Champion alongside Erica Tadurin and on behalf of Geoscience Australia's Gender Equity Network, I would like to welcome you to this morning's Wednesday seminar to celebrate International Women's Day. And we're a little early, it's actually Friday the 8th, um, but we're celebrating today. International Women's Day is celebrated globally. It has become a time to reflect on progress, to call for change, and to celebrate the courage and determination of the women who changed history and those who will advance gender equity into the future. It is a day when all who identify as women are recognised for their achievements. The theme for International Women's Day 2024 is Count Her In, um, Invest in Women, Accelerate Progress. It's based on the prior priority theme for the United Nations 68th Commission on the Status of Women, Counter In, which examines the pathways to greater economic inclusion for women and girls everywhere. Today, we are delighted to have with us Dr. Kirsten uh, Oberprela, uh, who is speaking about biases, black belts and Barbies. What a great title. <laughs> um, she will be uh, exploring the biases um, behind gender and sharing some of your personal experiences about overcoming them, not just in professional life, but also in personal life as well. Dr. Kirsten is a gamification and behavioral designer, blending academic research with design and innovation to tackle behavior and engagement challenges. She works with governments, private organizations, educational institutions and not-for-profits to apply psychology to deliver impact. Dr. Kirsten has her PhD in behaviour change and gamification and is described as one of the world's leading figures in behavioural science by Insight Success magazine. She is an adjunct fellow at the University of Western Sydney and is a sought after keynote speaker, having presented in Australia, Germany, USA, Singapore, Hong Kong, you name it, um, lots and lots of speaking engagements. And I believe you also have a TED talk um, available as well. Um, so I'd like you all to warmly uh, introduce or maybe welcome uh, Dr. Kirsten to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much everyone for being here and thank you to everyone online as well. I'm very excited to um, present today. So, um, before I start, I'd also like to take a moment to welcome the traditional custodians and the lands on which we're meeting um, here in Canberra, that's Ngunnawal and Nambri people, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also um, extend that uh, welcome to um, and that respect to all First Nations people. Uh, so I think we've sort of covered it in my bio, but I, I work as a behavioural and gamification designer. So essentially I apply psychology to business and other and community and other type of engagement and behavioural challenges. So basically I find behaviour fascinating um, and, uh, and, uh, and work in um, creative ways to, to change behaviour for the better. And there's just some of my clients and some awards that my work has done, uh, has won there. So today we're going to talk about a few things. We're first going to talk about biases, why they exist, um, and some common ones um, that um, around gender and also some, um, some ways that, that we can go about um, reducing um, or eliminating those biases. I'm also going to share a little bit about my personal experience, which is where the black belts comes in, and then talk a little bit um, about Barbie as a you know, potential way forward. Before we start, I'd like you to enjoy, uh, join me in a mini experiment. So in behavioral science, we love experiments. So if you can, and people online as well, please participate. <laughs> I'd like you to take out your phone. I'd like you to have a look at the number of the last person that you spoke with, the last number that you called, the last number that called you, and remember the last four digits. So have a look at the number, look at the last four digits, and try to remember them backwards, and then put your phone away. 
Okay, assuming everyone's done that. So remember the last four digits backwards. Can I have a, um, a show of hands? Who knows what time it was on their phone? When you looked at it just now. <laughs> That's right. Very few. Some people can, but 90, 95% of people in this uh, experiment can't remember the time, even though it was right there on the screen that you were looking at. So really fascinating. You're like, well, hang on, Kirsten, you tricked me. I mean, partly, that was partly, <laughs> partly it. But the information was right there, and yet your, and your, your eyes saw it, but your brain didn't register it. And the reason for this is um, our brain has limited mental capacity and we have what's called inattentional blindness where we can see information that's right up in our face and our brains don't register it. So that's just um, a, a small little experiment um, to demonstrate um, why our brain is, is, is open to biases. So our brain is the most expensive organ. Up to two thirds of our daily glucose go just so our brain can run. Two thirds, it's massive, massive, massive amount. And because of this, um, our brain tries to shortcut as many decisions um, and inf information processes as it can. Um, and the way that um, scientists sometimes think about the brain is in system one and system two, um, where actually most of our decisions are made in system one. So system one is an evolutionary older part of the brain. Um, it's fast, it's automatic, it's emotional, and we've got reflexes, we can do multitasking. The example I use of multitasking here is bad and I should change it, but I haven't yet, so I'll share it anyway. So once, once you've learned to drive, you could drive and eat at the same time. You shouldn't, that's illegal. But as an example, or maybe talking on the phone, also bad. Anyway, you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, those are things that you can multitask on because, because they're, they're habitual and they're in system one. System two is an evolutionary older part of the brain. So it's developed a lot later in, in mammals and in humans. This, this is a prefrontal cortex and that's responsible for slow, deliberate thinking, things like logic, problem solving, um, things that require patience, and also things like, um, like mathematics and poetry, right? They happen up here and we can't multitask that. We can't write poetry while solving a mathematical equation. Um, so what's interesting is when we're stressed, this part of the brain, because it takes a lot of effort, shuts down and again we defer back to system one. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. It, our brain does it um, to conserve energy, but it does mean that because our system one is, is lazy, <laughs> it is open to, to biases and other things that try to make it um, uh, cost less energy. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what some of those biases are. So a bias or a co so cognitive bias is a systemic error in thinking um, to do with information processing and decision making, and it affects our judgments. And again, it comes back to the reason is that our brain is expensive. Um, it prioritizes survival. And often survival means conserving energy. Um, and so it tries to simpli simplify and automate as much as possible um, to save energy and time. So you know, if you've ever walked into a room and like switched on the light and you're like, I didn't need to do that. Why did I do that? <laughs> it's because your brain's paired the act of walking into a room with the act of switching on the light. Um, again, just to try to save energy or it automates it. So again, there's a really good, important reason why our brain um, has evolved this way, but it does mean we're open to biases, and there are hundreds of them. Here are just, just a few. Um, so biases affect our decision-making and our behavior. It affects how we process information. Um, so things like the primacy effect, information or people or things that um, occur first in the line of things, we tend to remember better. Um, probability, it affects memory, hindsight bias. I knew that was gonna happen. Like, did you? Because most people think it's they once it's happened, they you know, it's again it's a bias in, in our memory. And there's social biases, and we'll talk about in-group, out-group bias a little bit today. And then even financial and, and economic decision making, so sunk cost fallacy and those sorts of things sorts of things. So our brain has hundreds of biases um, that affect um, how we think. So I want to talk a little bit about in-group and out-group bias um, as it you know, relates to gender and other things. So an in-group basically is a group that, um, that you identify with uh, and an out-group is the, the other. So an in-group can be made up of friends and family, uh, community, sports teams, political party, gender and sexual orientation, religious, nation and so forth. It's really interesting as well because um, an in-group can form within a matter of minutes and on arbitrary characteristics um, such as, uh, and invented ones such as which uh, um, Harry Potter house 
you're part of. You know, <laughs> Slytherin versus Gryffindor, not a real thing, but we all know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, right? Um, uh, and, and there's experiments where you can do that with people coming into a room and just by the order or the colour of your hair or anything like this, and, it can, and we can start to exhibit some of these in-group and out-group behaviours. So some of those behaviours mean, um, and these biases mean that our in-group we view more positively. We view them as individuals, like we're all such a unique, interesting mix of people, the out-group, they're all the same. Um, for our in-group, we show a lot more empathy. We, we judge um, the out-group a lot, a lot harsher. Um, our our in-group is perceived to have a higher ability um, and we are more um, lenient when it comes to moral judgment. So basically, if our in-group makes a mistake, we, um, we, 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 go, we go easy on them. If an out, a member of our out-group makes a mistake, we're a lot harsher on them. So really interesting. And you can see how this plays out and has some potentially quite bad uh, um, and quite significant um, uh, impacts on how we behave around other people. Now what's interesting about biases is that a lot of them are unconscious. There's things we can do to bring our awareness to them and some of them that's all we need to do and others we still need to counteract. So biases are unconscious until you flip them. So has anyone heard of this Facebook group? Man who has it all. <laughs> um, if not, I suggest you, you check it out. Um, so Man Who Has It All is a Facebook group that um, that's a bit of a um, takes a bit of a satirical approach to, to gender, um, and they and they kind of flip it. So I'll give you some examples. All men, is your face poreless? Are your eyes waterproof? Are you matte, dewy, or high coverage? Can you control oil for eight hours? Do you look awake? Is it okay to have a face? Okay, so it's a little bit satirical, as you can see. Um, uh, and another example, talking to men is a minefield. You have to avoid leering at them, scoring them out of 10, and treating them like accessories. It's exhausting, says Claire, CEO. Uh, two more examples. Um, woman in the phones is a gender-neutral uh, phrase, referring to both women and men answering the phone. I woman the phones, and I'm very good at it. I bet you are. Well done, mate. Ben, <laughs> age 43. And what assumptions can we make about a man's commitment to a career when he becomes a father? So um, in some ways it's quite funny and I think it's, it's important to um, add humour to be able to talk about difficult, um, t uh, potentially difficult topics. And I think um, this uh, man who has it all kind of flips it quite nicely. And I think when you flip it as well and take it, um, uh, you know, like change the context, you kind of go, well, that is a bit ridiculous. Like we would never advertise to a man in the way that we say do to a woman for some of these products. And it, it you know, makes you kind of realise how ridiculous it is once you've flipped it because it was so unconscious, it's, so, it's like a fish in water, right? It's, it's around us, we just take it, take it as normal. Um, so yeah, check that one out if you're interested. So now when it comes to how do we actually overcome some of these biases? Um, so I wanted to share a theory and a couple of studies from behavioral science. Um, a key one is contact theory, and I apologize, there's a lot of information on this slide, um, I just I wanted to share it all. So um, basically contact theory says that um, one way to reduce in-group and out-group bias is to have positive equal encounters between individuals of, the, of these different groups, um, because it helps kind of build understanding. So that interpersonal contact um, does a lot to reduce, uh, to reduce that because we start to see them as an individual um, rather than as part of this homogenous group. Um, it also then um, kind of, you can recategorize people and go, okay, well, I like this individual and they're part of the art group I didn't like and you know, so it starts to kind of break down some of that. It also allows us to have more empathy and perspective taking um, and potentially even and share, have, understand that we share common goals. Um, now, contact theory has been proven to work. However, you need to make sure it's equal status. So, for example, if you're trying to specifically use contact theory to break down um, uh, some of these biases, if you have, say, a grad and a CEO, there's a, there's a power difference there or, you know, other types of um, social status. So it needs to be equal status and it needs to be positive as well and it needs to be in an environment where there's institutional support. Um, I wanted to share a study. This one's a little bit old, but it's still kind of interesting, um, uh, which was using contact theory for um, uh, divisions between Catholic and Protestant students. So there's students going to the same school, but, um, but you know, strong different views um, there. Um, and so same thing, what they did is they, they created small mixed ability groups um, and got them to work together on a task. Um, there's a lot in terms of having a goal that's bigger than ourselves um, that helps people um, come together. And they had a control and, and an, exper an experimental group and they found that um, by having this mixed ability, small collaborative group, 
It reduced bias, improved the, the relations, inter, intergroup relations, and also generally created a positive atmosphere. So I think what this shows us is that if, when we're trying to use contact theory to reduce biases, we need to create structured opportunities um, for people to come together and have these equal status exchanges because that can help chip away. Another um, uh, proven way to do this is, is perspective taking, so stepping into other people's shoes. Um, so this was um, an experiment uh, where they had um, people watch other people in pain, okay, for the name of science. <laughs> it was in the, it was, a, you know, a little bit, uh, many years ago, but anyway, science. <laughs> um, so basically they watched, uh, watched a person, again we had um, uh, one that was going, imagine how this person feels. Then we had one going, imagine yourself in that situation. And then there was another sort of aspect to which, which, which was talking about, well, they're getting a treatment and the treatment is painful, but it helps them. So basically the results showed that empathy makes us want to act. So when we take the perspective of the other person and we go, oh, they're in pain, we, we empathize and we want to act. Um, but if it's too much and we become too distressed, if, if there's too much pain, we actually disassociate. Again, it's a survival thing. We don't like to engage with too much pain. So there's a sweet spot there. Um, but also uh, it showed that empathy is a complex process that also involves thoughts. So how we think, like the information we have about a situation affects how we interpret it, affects how we feel about it. So we need to understand the, the, the whole, like the, the, the um, situation in which another's pain occurs. Um, and the same scientists um, thought, oh, this pain experiment is fun, let's do it again. Um, so, so they did a similar thing. Um, this time people listened to um, a pilot uh, interview of, of a young woman in serious need, and there was three conditions. One was told, remain objective. One was, again, imagine how this young woman feels, and the other one was, imagine how you would feel. And so this, um, what they were looking at is, the, what is, what's the difference between imagine how they feel and imagine how I would feel in that situation? And they found that the, how they would feel, it produces empathy and altruistic motivation. So wanting to help just out of the goodness of your heart. The how would you feel evoked empathy. It also evolved, involved, um, dis, evoked distress, distress, but also egotistic motivation. Because you were so distressed at, at being like, well, if I was in that situation, I would feel really bad. It actually created more desire to act. It wasn't as pure, it wasn't altruistic, it's a little bit selfish, but maybe that doesn't, doesn't matter. So basically, how would you feel in that situation leads to a stronger impulse to act, act than just um, pure empathy for the other person. So when we look at um, behavioral science, behavioral design, there's a process that we go through. Um, and so I just wanted to share with you, I suppose, how, um, how, how we take this, this type of knowledge and how we apply it. We go through a process of really understanding the situation, designing interventions and testing them and so forth. So now we get to the second part um, of the talk, which is about black belts. Um, so I was asked to share some of my personal experiences. So I wanted to share um, uh, two, two examples from my life uh, where I've um, worked and hopefully done well in male-dominated industries. Um, so the first is um, in, in a tech startup. So both startups and tech um, are, are male-dominated. Um, and, and so is STEM, for the, you know, as you'll know. Um, so mainly male peers, um, investors, all male. Board members, all male. Martial arts as well, something I've done for uh, 24 years. Um, it's a physical sport, um, and again, lots of, um, I think the, the, um, the ratio of, of um, people coming in is there's a lot more males doing martial arts, but then a lot more that stay and get senior ranked and so forth. Male instructors, male gym owners. <clears throat> Um, and so that's not necessarily good or bad, you know, it kind of is what it is, um, but there are within that certain experiences that you have as a woman that you, that you might not otherwise. Um, so I had a startup called PentaQuest Gamification Startup um, that, um, that I founded, um, and at some point we got to a stage where we were going out for venture capital. Um, and you may be interested to know, or you may already know, that, uh, that less than 2% of um, VC funds go to women businesses. Even though um, women found business, businesses, um, it's about like 40, 40 to 60 percent. So it's not like there are no, no women starting businesses. Um, it's just that only 2 percent of them get funded. Um, and there's other things like being interrupted frequently or you know, males being patronizing and, and so forth. So um, that's really interesting, really interesting to, to kind of navigate that. In martial arts as well, um, there's assumed roles. Well, if you're the woman, you must be doing, you must be the secretary, or you must be doing the admin, or you know, so forth. And also, um, sometimes having a perception of lower coaching ability just by being a woman. 
Um, and I was looking at the stats in terms of women-owned clubs, martial arts clubs, and the stat says 27%, which I was felt quite high because in my experience, it's more like one, or one in 10 or one in 50, like very few women own martial arts clubs. Sometimes they do it, they own it with their husbands, but not by themselves. Um, and then same thing in terms of the ratio, some of the research says four to one. In my experience, it's more like 10 to one. Um, so there's, you know, we can, we can overcome these, right? So I, I've found success in business, I've successfully sold it. Um, uh, and I, part of how I did that is connected with, you know, wonderful supportive people and wonderful supportive males as well, as well as connecting in with other women. So here in Canberra, we have the Canberra Innovation Network, um, which for me um, really opened my eyes. And um, one of the biases that, um, that this uncovered, so I was um, shortlisted for, um, a, uh, or like a like a women in in tech pitch event. So ten women, myself included, from all of Australia, went for a, a pitching event that was specifically geared to women to try to overcome some of these um, uh, some of these biases in terms of um, uh, VC funds. And I didn't realise until I met these ten other these nine other beautiful, um, strong, successful women. Um, so about half of them had children and a startup. And I didn't realize until I met them that I thought I could either have a startup or a child. And I chose startup. I've now had a child, so I've, I've reversed that, right? I like that thing. But I didn't realize that I had that belief until I met other women where I could see that they were having young families and successful businesses and businesses that were bigger and more successful than mine as well. Um, same with the martial arts um, side of things. So I've got multiple black belts. I've represented Australia. Um, and um, I'm proud to say about a week ago, I opened my own martial arts club. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> and this was about, this was 17 years after someone first suggested it to me. And I thought about it, and uh, I'm not getting emotional, sorry. <clears throat> no, not sorry. <laughs> um, and I thought about it, and I thought, I mean, there was, there was reasons why I didn't act upon someone going, well, why don't you start it? You know, I was business, got my PhD, then I had a you know, child and things. But I thought about it, and I thought, if I was a male, I probably would not have waited 17 years. <laughs> anyway, it finally got there, but uh, yeah, there we go. So, we know what the science says, we have personal experience, where do we take it? Um, well, this is where I think Barbie can perhaps point the way. Um, can I have a show of hands who's seen the Barbie movie? Excellent, good on you, good on you. So I was thinking about this because a couple of months ago um, I was um, at an event, um, I was speaking, a few other women were speaking and organised it and, and afterwards we took a picture of all, of all of us for having, you know, done this event and social media and whatnot. And there's all these amazing women um, and after the photo was taken they were like, oh, is everyone happy with it? And one, one woman said, oh, my face is so round, I'm so short, I don't like my hair. And I, I just said, stop, we're all powerful, beautiful women. And I was thinking, I was like, again, um, if, if it was a, an, an all-male thing in that situation, I, I don't think, and I don't know, men, you can correct me if you're wrong, but I can't imagine that, that you would be right away criticising your appearance. And I just thought, what, what is going on here? So I didn't include the picture here for you know, privacy reasons. Um, and just as a fun little side note, I asked um, AI to generate me <laughs> a picture of a diverse range of successful professional women. Um, uh, and then it gave me... This wasn't even the first image. It gave me this and I said, no, 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 give me one that's short, give me one that's tall, give me one that's thin, give me thing that's bigger, older, younger, and it just gave me these thin 20-year-old supermodels. <laughs> so I was like, well, if that doesn't talk about gender bias, I don't know what does. So <laughs> anyway, so I left it in because I wanted to share that with you. So um, in Barbie land, and for those that haven't seen Barbie, I do encourage you to do it. I will not do any spoilers, um, but just kind of the very opening parts of the movie. So basically in Barbie land, it's 100% owned and run by women. Um, and they spend their days uh, for the enjoyment of themselves. Beach, they go to the beach, they have girls night, uh, they go to award ceremonies, things for their own enjoyment. And also Ken's exist purely for Barbie. Ken does, Ken's day is made when Barbie looks at him, so that's kind of fun as well. But um, so again, you know, we talked about at the start when you, when you flip it, um, I think what Barbie does, it kind of flips society and goes, what if it was purely, um, you know, female run? Um, so again, I, I just think it's so interesting because it just, it really sheds a light when we, when we flip things. And what I would like um, us all to think about is as we go, as we kind of, you know, go about our days, think about what would Barbie do? Okay. Um, so this is in one of the open scenes, again, no spoilers, but one of the opening scenes, um, this Barbie here is receiving the Nobel Prize in Journalism. 
And rather than saying, I'd like to thank my partner, I'd like to thank my parents, I'd like to thank... She goes, no, I worked very hard and I deserve it. And everyone's like, yeah, you did, you know? So I was like, awesome. Um, this Barbie here is receiving um, uh, an award for, her, for being an author. Um, and the, the presenter says, you're the voice of a generation. And she says, I know. <laughs> and I was like, that's just cool, right? And then finally is lawyer Barbie who says, this makes me emotional and I'm expressing it. I have no difficulty holding both logic and feelings at the same time. And it doesn't diminish my powers. In fact, it expands them. And I was like, yeah, so cool. So I think when we, when we think about what would Barbie do, um, they're, they're joyful and they're loving of themselves and of the other women around them. Um, don't minimize your success. You work hard and, and you know, really you know, um, appreciate how much you deserve those things and stand in your power. So what would Barbie do? And then so finally, you know, um, biases exist in ourselves, within our peer groups and our organisations and also system systematically. So in yourself, be aware of um, some of these biases. They will, again, awareness goes a long way. Um, and so things you can do is don't assume women have certain roles. Um, don't interrupt them when they're talking. Um, actively try to counteract some of these biases in yourself. And then as, as women, stand in your power. For others, speak up for peer behaviour, um, be a role model and keep others accountable for how we, even those small little interactions and, and small exchanges can make a really big difference to how somebody feels about themselves. And then systematically, there's things we can do around organisational policies like leave, um, parental policies, flexible work, things like bias training, um, recruiting diversely and de-biasing how we, how we can recruit um, and keeping ourselves accountable. So that's it. Thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank <laughs> you.